Matter isn't dead dust. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. Matter is what matters. There's a definition. That's a very weird definition. But what's real? Matter. It's like, okay, that's one answer. What's real? What matters is real. Because that's how you act. Okay, so that's different than matter. It's like, okay, what's the most real of what matters? How about pain? Why is it the most real? Try arguing it away. Good luck. So pain is the fundamental reality. All right. Well, that's rough. Doesn't that lead to not- Bro, this is why Andrew Tate fucking cumstered this man, okay? With how much clout he was able to cultivate by just taking the, sta taking the same shtick and basically stupidifying it, okay? Making it dumber. Like, misogyny in and of itself is popping, okay? It's fucking great. You can absolutely, uh, you know, uh, clearly build a, a brand for yourself by leaning on it and making yourself the face of misogyny, like Andrew Tate did, okay? Like Jordan Peterson did before him. But the difference is, like, Jordan Peterson was so fucking... Jordan Peterson is so fucking boring and so, like, academic and so self-important that, um, you know, there was, there was always going to be an inevitable end to his shtick. He cries too much. He cries too much. Too much of a baby. Was he always as pathetic? He seems to be getting worse and worse. I think... I think he has gotten worse as well from his all meat diet, most likely. Hold on. Nihilism I gotta and hopelessness. Gotta grab my food. Yeah, doesn't it lead to a philosophy that's antithetical towards being? The most fundamental reality is pain. Yes. Is there anything more fundamental than pain? Love. Really? If you're in pain, Love and truth, that's what you got. And you know, if they're more powerful than pain, maybe they're the most real things. I don't even know what the fuck he's talking about half the time, dude. I'm just, I'm too stupid to understand where he's coming from, okay? The Benzos broke this man, and uh, guess what? I don't need to, but we will watch this entire thing. I do want to see... I do want to see Lex Friedman with uh, with with uh, our, our boy here a little bit. I want to I wanna look at, like, uh, I want to take a peek. Battle not with monsters, lest ye become a monster. Yeah. And if you gaze into... Oh, my God. Two of them. Oh, Dostoevsky, God. Science, death. Elon Musk, global crisis, dangerous ideology. Justin Trudeau, war in Ukraine. Day in the life. How to think. Advice, depression, advice for young people. Russian literature. I cannot comprehend a more boring fucking subject matter to go over. Holy fuck. At a certain point. At a certain point, okay, why is Jordan Peterson interesting? Why is Jordan Peterson content? Jordan Peterson's content for people who like Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson's content when he's destroying the woke libtards, right? Wokeism. The woke ap apocalypse, okay? I'm not going to watch this entire thing. I would fucking die if I watched this, okay? I would literally die. I would get banned on 820 because I fucking died on camera from uh, the permanent brain damage that I caused upon myself by watching this thing. Okay, no, I did see the crying. I saw that clip already. Okay. So when you get someone like Jordan Peterson to talk about all this endless shit, at a certain point, people are going to be like, all right, this is not that fun. This is not actually interesting. This is not actually making me... Um, this is not actually going to... to like, even all the people that watch Jordan Peterson to be like, oh, he's so brilliant, he's so brave, he's so fucking bold. Even all those people ultimately would basically uh, uh, go, okay, I can't watch this because it's fucking boring as shit. Oh, fuck. There's a small F. Uh, 
Yeah, Hank Pecker died and came back alive, okay? I mean, Hank Pecker's gone. Brief hiccup, brief hiccup. Well, let me ask you one short-lived biological meat bag to another. Who is God, then? Oh my God, this is like the ultimate, like, smoking weed with, like, two freshman philosophy students. Oh, Jesus Christ, is going to make me fucking die. Hold on. Let's try to sneak up to this question, if it's at all possible. Is it possible to even talk about this? Well, it better be, because otherwise there's no communicating about it, right? It, it has to be something that can be brought down to earth. Well, we might be too dumb to bring it down. It's not just ignorant, it's also sinful, right? So, because there's not knowing, and then there's not wanting to know, or refusing to know. Yeah. And so you might say, well, could you extract God from a description of the objective world, right? Is, is God just the ultimate unity of, 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 of the natural reality? And I would say, well, in a sense, there's some truth in that, but, but not exactly, because God, in the highest sense, is the spirit that you must emulate in order to thrive. How's that for a biological definition? Spirit is a pattern. The spirit that you must emulate in order to thrive. So it's a, it's a kind of, uh, in one sense, when we say the human spirit, mm -hmm. it's that. It's an animating principle. Yeah. It's a meta, it's a pattern. Okay. And you might say, well, what's the pattern? Okay, well, I can tell you that to some degree. Imagine that, like you're gripped by beauty, you're gripped by admiration. So, and you can just notice this. This isn't propositional. You have to notice it. It's like, oh, turns out I admire that person. Hmm. So what does that mean? Well, it means I would like to be like him or her. That's what admiration means. It means there's something about the way they are that compels imitation, another instinct, or inspires respect or awe even. Okay, what is that that grips you? Well... No content, have an ass, dude. Okay, okay, okay. Death, don't care about that. Elon Musk. What do you make of Elon Musk? You okay, let's let's move on to something that's more tangible, okay? I can't I can't have like the pseudo intellectual uh the the pseudo intellectual intro to philosophy fucking back and forth about God and and, and meaning of life from two dudes who are so fucking painfully boring. Okay? You can say I'm stupid and and honestly, sure. I, I'd rather be fucking brain dead than watch a single fucking moment of this, okay? You've spoken about him a bit. You met I'm him. struck with admiration. Uh, That's what I make of him. And I always, think, this idea I always of think of that as a primary. Well, it's, all, it's like, do you find this comedian funny? It's like, well, I laugh at him. You know what I mean? It's not propositional again. And so I would, there are things I would like to ask Mr. Musk about. The Mars venture, I don't know what he's up to there. It strikes me as absurd in the most fundamental sense, because I think, well, it'd be easier just to build an outpost in the Antarctica or in the desert. Well, how much of the human endeavor is absurd? Well, th that's what did Nietzsche say? Great men are seldom credited with their stupidity. <laughs> Who the hell knows what Musk is up to? I mean, obviously, he's building rockets. Now, he's motivated because he wants to build a, a, a platform for life on Mars. Is that a good idea? Who am I to say? Do you he's, think he's building the rockets, man, but I'd like to ask him about it. I, I would like to see that conversation. I do think that having talked to him quite a bit offline, I think these several of his ideas like Mars, like humans becoming a multiplanetary species, mm -hmm. could be one of the things that human civilization looks back at as, duh, I can't believe he is one of the few people that was really pushing this idea because it's the obvious thing for, for society, to, for life to survive. Yeah, well, it isn't obvious to me that I'm in any position to evaluate Elon Musk. Like, I would like to talk to him and find out what he's up to and why, but, I mean, he's an impossible person. What he's done is impossible. All of it. Yeah, no one has thought about space travel. It's so crazy that Elon Musk invented the idea of wanting to live on other planets. It's crazy. It's like he built an electric car that works. Now, does it work completely? And will it replace gas cars or should it? I don't know. But if we're going to build electric cars, he seems to be the best at that by a lot. And he more or less did that. People. 
No, what? Elon Musk invented space travel, the concept of space travel, invented electric vehicles. This is what happens when you're so fucking high on crack, on the crack that is capitalist dogma, that you literally ascribe some of the most like fundamentally false uh, sentiments to singular individuals because you have to ride by it. Meritocracy is real. Elon Musk is a fucking legend. He has to be because he worked really hard and he worked really smart. So yeah. He's the, he's the one who has, like, one of the few people that has pontificated on, uh, you know, becoming an interplanetary species. I feel like, I mean, this is dick riding harder than fucking Aiden Ross himself, you know what I mean? With Andrew Tate. A little carp about him, but he more or less did that by himself. I know he's very good at distributing responsibility and all of that, but he's the spearhead. And then that was pretty hard. And then he built a rocket at like one-tenth the price of NASA rockets. And then he shot his car out into space. That's pretty hard. And then he's building this boring company, more or less as a, what would you call it? It's sort of, it's this whimsical joke in some sense, but it's not a joke. He's amazing. And you're a link. Delving into the uh, the depths yeah. of the mind. And Starlink. It's like, go Elon, as far as I'm concerned. And then, you know, he puts his finger on things so oddly. The, prop the problem is underpopulation. It's like, I think so too. I think it's a terrible problem that we're, the West, for example, is no longer at replacement with regard to birth rate. It means we've abandoned the virgin and the child in a most fundamental sense. It's a bloody catastrophe. And Musk, he's, he sees it clear as can be. It's like, well, and where everyone else is running around going, oh, there's too many people. It's like, nope, got that. Not only, see, I've learned that there are falsehoods and lies and there are anti-truths. And an anti-truth is something that's so preposterous that you couldn't, you couldn't make a claim that's more opposite to the truth. And the claim that there are too many people on the planet is an anti-truth. So, you know, people say, well, you have to accept limits to growth and et cetera. It's like, I have to accept the limits that you're going to impose on me because you're frightened of the future. That's your theory, is it? Okay. Well, I love that he said, like, I don't disagree with him that there are too many people on the planet, right? I don't, I don't disagree with that take. The idea that there are like the idea that like our planet has uh, finite resources and we can't make do and allow everyone to survive on it, I don't agree with. Okay. But also, this notion that like the West is this notion that the West is like uh, being replaced or is not able to replace itself because of our declining birth rates. It's a consequence of a multitude of factors, but none of which is actually forced at gunpoint. It's such a silly one. He said we're underpopulated. Yeah, I'm saying, like, I agree with him against the notion that, like, there, um... I agree with him. I do think we have enough resources for everyone and more people. It's a matter of distribution. I am not like a Malthusian eco-fascist, okay? I agree with him on that front. I don't agree with him when, it ta when he talks about... I don't agree with him when he talks about, like, the West as this, like, you know, tangible concept that is, like, in decline as a consequence of the birth rates being in decline, okay? Like, who, who cares? Who cares if the West is, like, in decline? It's very stupid. You only care about that if you ascribe, like, a certain value to the West and you think it's somehow inherently superior to everything else, okay? 
and you believe that there should be more people because otherwise if there are less people then it'll be overtaken by you know lesser uh, forces forces that do not deserve the superiority but will gain it by sheer uh manpower which is of course a uh inherently reaction inherently reactionary concept well, it's an idea. It could be a right idea. It could be a wrong idea. I don't I think anti-truth. Well, here, I'll tell you why it's the wrong idea, mm -hmm. I think. So imagine that there's an emergency dragon. There's a dragon. Someone comes and says, there's a dragon. I'm the guy to deal with it. That's what the environmentalists say, the radical types who push limits to growth. And then I look at them and I think, okay, is that dragon real or not? That's one question. Well, I asked is that the... question. Oh, thank you. Immediate threat. Oh, he's talking about fucking, he's talking about like how climate change is fake because the oil and gas industry needs to keep producing output. I know myself every time is when the, I spend time alone. Is the apocalypse looming on the environmental front? Yes or no. I'll just leave that aside for the time being. I think you can make a case both ways for a bunch of different reasons. And it's not a trivial concern. And we've overfished the oceans terribly. And there are environmental issues that are looming large. Whether climate change is the card. Overfishing in the oceans is the funniest way to shift the responsibility away from the oil and gas producers, by the way. Jordan Peterson most notably became just like oil and gas lobbyist. It's very strange. And the only reason why it brings up overfishing is because he, he wants to, he wants to shift the focus away from our over-reliance on fossil fuels. Okay. Straight up. He has said time and time again. He unironically also overfishing is bad. Yeah, I mean, yes. But don't be a fucking sucker is what I'm saying. Cardinal one or not is a whole different question, but we won't get into that. That's not the issue. You're clamoring about a dragon. Okay. Why should I listen to you? Well, let's see how you're reacting to the dragon. First of all, you're scared stiff and in a state of panic. That might indicate you're not the man for the job. Second, you're willing to use compulsion to harness other people to fight the dragon for you. So now not only are you terrified, you're a terrified tyrant. So then I would say, well, then you're not the Moses that we need to lead us out of this particular exodus. And maybe that's a neurological explanation. It's like, if you're so afraid of what you're facing, that he's reducing the way to combat climate change back to individual responsibility by claiming that the only way to defeat climate change, anthropogenic climate change, is by stopping you from like eating burgers or whatever. He's not directly saying it, but that's what he's basically pointing to. But that is actually a complete a uh, uh, mischaracterization, whereas uh, lowering global emissions revolves around putting actual regulatory mechanisms in place against the oil and gas producers. And that is precisely what he doesn't want to openly state. Okay? He does not want to fucking mention that. Because, and I suspect this is uh, uh, the reason, he is backed by the oil and gas industry. He fucking always says shit that is a direct one-to-one, -one, bar for bar, verbatim fucking regurgitation of what the oil and gas lobby says. Okay? All the time. It's wild. And I don't know why motherfuckers don't consider this. Like, I don't know why people can't see it. Okay? That you're terrified into paralysis and nihilism, and that you're willing to use tyrannical compulsion to get your way, you are not the right leader for the time. So then I like someone like Bjorn Lomberg or Matt Ridley or Marion Tupi. And they say, well, look, we've got our environmental problems. And uh, maybe there's a, there, you could make a case that there's a Malthusian element in some situations. 
But fundamentally, the track record of the human race is that we learn very fast and faster all the time to do more with less. Yeah, the only way to deal with climate change is by killing half the population. And by half the population, I mean like the entire global south so that the good half can survive. Yes, and we've got this. And I think, yes, to that idea. And I think about it in a, in a fundamental way. It's like, I trust Lomberg. I trust Tupi. I trust Matt Ridley. They've thought about these things deeply. They're not just saying, oh, the environment doesn't matter, whatever the environment is. You know, the environment. I don't even know what that is. That's everything. The environment. I'm concerned about the environment. It's like, which is, how is that different than saying I'm worried about everything? How, how are those statements different semantically? I've heard him say well, this before. Yeah, it's really funny. It could be, I'm worried about human society. A lot of these complex systems are difficult to talk about because there's so much involved for sure. Yeah, everything. And yeah. then these models, because people have gone after me because I don't buy the climate models. Well, I think about the climate models as extended into the economic models because the climate model is... They do too, brother. What do you mean? It's so funny that Jordan Peterson acts like environmentalists and economists uh, don't think about like the impact of drastically reorienting reorienting society from its over reliance on fossil fuels. Like, yeah, no, people are just like, hey, you got to stop this. Of course it fucking matters. Of course. And people do think about that. But it's so wild that he acts like they don't. And he can say whatever the fuck he wants. I've never met someone that is so purposefully ignorant about the subject matter that he has no reason to cover, for the record, while simultaneously coming across as, like, the brilliant foremost authority on the matter. It's so wild. Like, he literally, the only thing that keeps this motherfucker going is the fact that he just uses $2 words and makes it seem like he is arriving at the objective truth because he refuses to actually give you anything but the underlying premises that he has made up or cherry-picked and he has put on top of one another to allow you to come to that conclusion on your own without, without ever saying exactly what he means. So we can always run away. Whenever someone, whenever someone calls him out, he can be like, well, I, I wasn't saying that. I was just simply stating... Do you really know? Do we really know what will happen? How could you say we know what will happen in the future? Haven't climate, uh, haven't climate uh, change scientists been wrong in the past by a couple degrees centigrade? Does that not mean that they are not all-knowing? Only God is all-knowing. Is Well, there's going to be a certain degree of heating, let's say, by 2100. It's like, okay, some of that might be human generated. Some of it's a consequence of warming after the ice age. This has happened before, but fair enough. Let's take your presumption. Although there are multiple presumptions and any error in your model multiplies as time extends, but to have it your way. Okay, now we're going to extend the climate model, so to speak, into the economic model. So I just did an analysis of a paper by Deloitte, third biggest company in the US, 300,000 employees, major league consultants. They just produced a report in May. I wrote an article for it in the Telegraph, which I'm going to release this week on my YouTube channel. Said, well, if we get the climate problem under control economically, because that's where the models are now being generated on the economic front. So now we have to model the environment, that's the climate, and we have to model the economy. And then we have to model their joint interaction. And then we have to predict 100 years into the future. And then we have to put a dollar value on that. And then we have to claim that we can do that, which we can't. And then this is our conclusion. We're going to go through a difficult period of privation. Because if we don't accept limits to growth, there's going to be a catastrophe 50 years in the future or thereabouts. And so to avert that catastrophe, 
we are going to make people poorer now. How much poorer? Well, not a lot compared to how much richer they're going to be, but definitely, and they say this in their own models, definitely poorer, definitely poorer than they would be if we just left them the hell alone. And so wow, that's crazy, bro. And by the way, when they say people, they're talking about the GDP or they're talking about the wealthiest corporations. Because it's not like you, the average fucking Joe, is going to be a, a hell of a lot poorer because you're getting poorer regardless, while the economy is better than ever before. The United States economy continues to grow, and yet the social safety nets that you would normally have continue to shrink. So how does that work? Isn't everything much better now? Carbon prices would raise global GDP by 3.5% according to IMF. This guy is just making shit up. <sighs> yeah, you already take pay cuts every year with inflation. But corporate profit margins are higher than ever before. So make that make sense. You are already becoming poorer. Do people think that we can't survive with a lower GDP, not realize that we did, in fact, survive with a lower GDP at every other point in human history? GDP does not need to continually rise. Yeah, I mean, that's get get excited at the prospect of everyone will dunk on this because under a capitalist system, of course, you have to consistently grow. You have to keep growing. There's no point in time when you can fucking there's no point in time when you can like put a stop to that at, at, at any given moment. <clears throat> And so then I think, okay, poorer, eh? Who? Well, let's look at it biologically. Got a hierarchy, right, of stability and security. That's a hierarchy, or one type. You stress a hierarchy like that, a social hierarchy. So there's birds in an environment, and an avian flu comes in. And then you look at the birds in the social hierarchy, and the the, the low-ranking birds have the worst nests, so they're most exposed to wind and rain and sun and farthest from food supplies. I think funny is, I think one of the funniest parts about this is that he always makes, like, animal kingdom analogies, and they almost always fucking fall short. Especially because, one, he's not a zoologist, but also... Also, like the animal kingdom is so fundamentally different, like from animal to animal, species to species, and certainly different than human beings, which do have some intrinsic values that are so fundamentally different than the rest of the species that you could ever talk about that like ever considering like, uh, even if you cast aside the, the obvious fallacy of appealing to nature, because the human condition is to overcome nature. It's the most human thing you can do. Even if you point it to like fucking like Jordan Peterson's insanely anti-trans narrative, it's like if you were to turn around and talk about how natural it is to be trans by pointing to seahorses. It's like the seahorse. The male seahorse, in the absence of a female seahorse being present, will shift and reorient its reproductive organs and become a female seahorse. There's nothing more inherently uh, natural than being trans. Like, boom, there you go. Boom, done. and most exposed to predators. And so those birds are stressed, which is what happens to you at the bottom of a hierarchy. You're more stressed because your life is more uncertain. You're more stressed. Your immunological function is compromised because of that. You're sacrificing the future for the present. An avian flu comes in and the birds die from the bottom up. That happens in every epidemic. You die from the bottom up. Okay, so they say when the aristocracy catches a cold, the working class dies of pneumonia. 
All right, so now we're going to make people poorer. Okay, who? Well, we I also do additionally love some of the biggest advocates of capitalism unironically using one of the fundamental problems within the capitalist organization of the economy as a reason for its continuation. That's always the best, where they're like, oh, well, when the aristocracy catches a cold, the working class suffer and die from pneumonia. Yeah, I wonder why that's the case. Okay, solve it, bitch. No, you can't. You must not. You must continue doing capitalism and more of it. We know who we make poor when we make people poorer. We make those who are barely hanging on poorer. And what does that mean? It means they die. And so what the Deloitte consultants are basically saying is, well, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. But according to our models, a lot of poor people are going to have to die so that a lot more poor people don't die in the future. It's like, okay, hold on a sec. Which of those two things am I supposed to regard with certainty? The hypothetical poor people that you're going to hypothetically save 100 years from now? Or the actual poor people that you are actually going to kill in the next 10 years? Well, I'm going to cast my lot with the actual poor people that you're actually going to kill. And so, and then I think further, it's like, well, okay, the Deloitte consultants, have you actually modeled the world? Or is this a big advertising shtick? Dude, this is my favorite fucking take. This is literally just like brain broken, okay? This, again, hinges on the stupidity of the audience that's listening to these words, okay? This is the exact same energy as chatters getting mad at me when I look at a fucking, um, when I look at a, 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 a statistic. Okay, a poll that is a sample size of 3,000. And then chatters will chirp and be like, uh, only 3,000 people were asked, Hassan. That's, I mean, they only asked 3,000 people. What do you mean by that? And it's like, that is an adequate sample size, you fucking idiot. A poll is not supposed to ask 300 million people. It's no longer a fucking poll at that point. Now it has become the census, okay? Lütfen, ciddi, ciddi söylüyorum, siktir git. Siktirdiğin yere mum diktir, okay? Allah belanızı verecek yani gerçekten. Yani götüne yarak yiyorsun her gün Erdoğan'ın Türkiye'sinde. Ama hala buraya gelip <gülüyor> Amerikalılara komünizm öğretiyorsun. CCC. Götüne girdi o C'lerin hepsi. Değil mi? Götüne girdi önden çıktı C. Geri zekalı. Komünizm salak salak salak. Sana ne amına koyayım sana ne? Sen zaten ölüyorsun. Orospu çocuğu. Sana ne? Ha? Siktir git. Geri zekalı. Tanzım satırlarını sabunuyor musun? Ne diyorsun ya? Senin gibi dallamalardan dolayı zaten Türkiye devamlı sikiliyor amına koyayım. Gel burada e, bana bağır. Geri zekalı. Designed to attract your corporate clients with the demonstration that you're so intelligent that you can actually model the entire ecosystem of the world, including the economic system, and predict it 100 years forward. And isn't there a bit of a moral hazard in making a claim like that? Just like just a trifle, especially when so I talked to Bjorn Lomberg and Michael Leon last week. I accepted the UN uh, estimates of starvation this coming year. 150 million people will suffer food insecurity. Food insecurity. Yeah, food insecurity. That's the bloody buzzword. Famine. Well, Michael Leon thought. I wonder why. Well, Jordan Peterson asked the question, why 100 million people will suffer from food insecurity when we have an abundance of food that we literally currently produce an abundance of food? Like globally. <clears throat> literally. Not just in America. Hmm. 
I wonder how that works. I wonder if that has something to do with the the uh, current state of affairs, the current organization of the economy, the way that it works. Huh. Probably not. One point two billion, and then that it'll spiral because he said what happens in a famine is that the governments go nuts, crazy. The governments destabilize, and then they appropriate the food from the farmers. Then the farmers don't have any money. Then they can a good maximum sample size is usually around ten percent of the population, as long as it does not exceed one uh, exceed one thousand. Brother, you're bringing up a maximum sample size. Can't grow crops, and I think yeah, that's exactly what they do. That's exactly what would happen, and so. Jan told me 1.2 billion, and then Bjorn Lomberg said the same thing. I didn't even ask him. He just made it as an offhand comment. So let me ask you about the famine of the 30s. Yeah. Do you think in the Ukraine? In the Ukraine. Oh, yeah. Fun, fun, fun. S similar. A lot of the things you mentioned in the last few sentences kind of echo to that part of human history. The whole Do Maduro. Do you Which no one knows about? <laughs> well, now I've just spent four weeks in Ukraine. I don't know if no one knows about that, bro. Ukraine. Oh, yeah. There's different parts of the world that still, even if they don't know, they know. Yeah, right. <laughs> they feel history is runs in the blood. The Dutch knew in some sense. They had a famine at the end of World War II. And part of the reason the Dutch farmers are so unbelievably efficient and productive is that the Dutch swore at the end of World War II that that was not going to happen again. And then they had to scrape land out of the ocean because Holland, that's quite a country. It shouldn't even exist. The fact that it's the world's number two exporter, you know that it's the world's number two exporter of agricultural products, Holland. It's like, I don't think it's as big as Massachusetts. It's this little tiny place, it shouldn't even exist. And they want to put, here's, this, here's the plan. Let's put 30% of the farmers out of business. Well, the broader ecosystem of agricultural production in Holland is 6% of their GDP. Now, these centralizing politicians think, tell me if I'm stupid about this. Take an industry. You knock it back by fiat by 30%. Now, it runs on like a 3% profit margin. Now, you're going to kill 30% of it. How are you not going to bring the whole thing down, the whole farming ecosystem down? How are you not going to impoverish the transport systems? How are you not going to demolish the grocery stores? You can't take something like that and pare it back by fiat by 30% and not kill it. I, I can't see how you can do that. I mean, look what we... What does Jordan Peterson think is going on with the Dutch government? Like, does he think the Netherlands wants to destroy agricultural production? Like, do you think they are deliberately fucking doing that? Or is he simply taking the side of the uh, incredibly wealthy farmers in this circumstance? Specifically because they're, te uh, they're, they're ostensibly against... The, the government taking any sort of fucking rollback on carbon production. It's just a fucking team sport. That's all it is. There's a plan to cut agricultural production by 30% in the meat industry to curb carbon emission. It's unacceptable. Unacceptable! Um, it's not even carbon, right? Uh, it, nitrogen and also... Uh, what is it? Hold on here. We'll look at it right now. Um, <clears throat> okay, where is 
Oh, this is from 2019. This is too old. Um, Netherlands agriculture is so big. The Netherlands is a tiny country. Its presence on the list is due to the high value of flowers and live plants. The Netherlands supplies nearly half of the global total. And vegetables, the Netherlands is a leading supplier of tomatoes and chilies. It's because of nitrogen and ammonia destroying the forest and nature. Netherlands is number two because of flowers. The 2019 thing is the same shit. This moron didn't hear about it till now because it didn't become a talking point. Okay. Here, let's look at this. The key environmental issues affecting the Netherlands include loss of biodiversity, climate change, and the overexploitation of natural resources, habitat fragmentation, atmospheric nitrogen deposition, and the loss of farmland. Bird populations are still being experienced despite national measures to combat these issues. Okay. So the Netherlands is is uh, is is breaking down the delicate ecosystem as a consequence of overproducing. Several of these problems have arisen as a result of the Netherlands' extensive agricultural transport, which has been greatly developed in the recent years. Unfortunately, the Netherlands has not met a number of its environmental commitments. For instance, its cur its goal to curb CO2 carbon dioxide, NH3 ammonia. And nitrogen oxides and VOC, volatile organic compounds emissions, increased green spaces in urban areas, and goals regarding the protection of nature. Okay. According to the executive summary from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, you know, a wonderful organization that I regularly point to when I talk about America's wrongs. It's necessary for the Netherlands to improve the cost effectiveness of its environmental policies, by the way. OECD only has one fucking method. And even in that method, it's like, still, it, this needs to be done by improving the cost effectiveness of its environmental policies. Investigate environmental concerns and reflect them in, a positive social, reflect them in positive social and economic decisions. These issues seem to be at the forefront of Dutch citizens' minds, as it was reported that in 2017, 81% of Dutch citizens expressed concern about the effects of plastic pollution and 83% of Dutch citizens were concerned about the impact of chemicals on the environment. Conservative voters in the Netherlands do not want their country to turn into a multicultural metropole. Yeah, that's pretty funny to say that because uh, it already is. When you're on the European continent, it is very difficult for you to not be multicultural. I think what they mean by multicultural is no Muslims, but even in that situation, it's too late, okay? Especially when you are the Netherlands and you are kind of, uh, you know, we're really big into the spice game and the slavery game and therefore colonized entire fucking nations uh, and then, you know, brought those people that you colonize back to the Netherlands. So that is precisely what happens. You could say no black people all you fucking want, no Muslims all you fucking want. But ultimately, they're there already. And that's also part of the reason why you have good food to begin with, okay? That's part of the reason why you have, like, at least some level of culture to begin with. Anyway. Uh, don't forget, farmers in the Netherlands are like little bourgeoisie, heavily subsidized, insanely rich, overwhelmingly white. Oh, Farmers in the Netherlands, one out of every five farmer in the Netherlands is a millionaire. One out of every five. That's insane, dude. These motherfuckers are selling flowers like crazy. Diversity is not a strength. <laughs> Bob Stopper. Bitch, listen to me. Unless your cousin fucking parents gave you some serious diagnosable genetic conditions as a consequence of ritualistic and systematic inbreeding. Don't fucking talk to me about how diversity is not a strength. Okay? I don't even know how you're able to fucking type when you only got three fingers on your fucking hand. Because that's what happens when you don't have diversity, you dumb bitch. That's what happens when you're keeping a fucking family. Yeah, lol, idiot, you stupid inbred fuck.
Least ableist Hazan take? Yes, I know. I am such an ableist for saying that um, making sure that your gene pool is diverse is actually a good thing and not a bad thing in the way that, like, ultra-nationalist white supremacists claim it is. I know. It's incredibly ableist of me to say that uh, cousin fucking leads to diagnosable medical conditions. I mean, if you think that that's ableist, then yes, I am ableist, like, straight up. This is literally... You know what this is? This is the fucking Twitter conversation about, like, stopping cousins from fucking one another. Stopping, trying to stop incest from happening is eugenics. But you're not trying to have that conversation, sweetie. That's what you're saying to me right now. You're just saying it in a very racist way, okay? You might not recognize that you're doing the exact same thing that the, like, dumb fucking woke lords would. Because you think you guys are like uh, on the opposing sides of that fucking argument. But you're not. Don't use inbred as an insult to someone. Inbred people with issues didn't choose that. That's a meme, right? Please, please, please tell me that's a joke. No, this is over. It's done. I'm done. It's true, lol. I've seen three-fingered people. Motherfucker keeps saying inbred. Like with an M. Oh my God. Okay, we're done. We're done. We're moving away from that immediately. I don't want to have that conversation. There's just no way to, to ever use any kind of pejorative. Every pejorative will ultimately be used towards some kind of fucking medical condition, okay? You ultimately will arrive at, don't say stupid because you're belittling people with uh, mental issues, you know what I mean? With, like, with a cognitive decline. We did with the COVID lockdowns. We broke the supply chains. Have you tried buying something lately? You can't, and wait, and aren't the Chinese threatening Taiwan at the moment? What are we going to do without chips? So, I don't know what these people are thinking. And then I think, okay, what are they thinking? Well, the Deloitte people are thinking, aren't we smart? And shouldn't we be hired by our corporate employers? It's like, okay, too bad about the poor. Um, what are the uh, environmental... This is such a funny way to... Like, environmental justice unironically revolves around helping people who have been fucked over by the the uh, endless growth model of capitalism that destroys environments specifically targeting the working poor, okay? And Jordan Peterson, instead of addressing any of those underlying realities like fucking Cancer Alley or the existence of, like, toxic pollutants in the water supply of, like, uh, many of the uh, marginalized communities or whatever... Or what that kind of impact has, what that kind of like consistent, never-ending growth model has had on the hyper-exploited uh, uh, global South uh, third world. Instead of fucking mentioning any of that, he's like, yeah, we're going to kill those guys. We're going to kill them harder. We're killing them now, but we're going to kill them so much harder. What do you mean, bro? We're killing them right now. This is supposed to literally work against that. Because... Anthropogenic climate change, as we have seen already, has created conditions where extreme weather conditions are, like, once in a thousand year extreme weather conditions are happening annually, okay? And it's going to continue to increase. And what happens if a fucking hurricane hits a wealthy neighborhood? That wealthy neighborhood will always be rebuilt. But when it hits a fucking poor neighborhood, that poor neighborhood never gets rebuilt, okay? 
Look no further than once again. I'm talking about Cancer Alley, and I'm I'm just uh, I'm I'm hitting Nola pretty hard today. But look at New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. There are there there are still desolate buildings that have been marked by the government for uh, demolition that they still have not fucking built, that they still have not rebuilt. Look at Puerto Rico in the aftermath of Irma. Poor people all around are already getting fucked over by anthropogenic climate change, and it's only going to get worse. Reckless thinking. We love the planet. It's like, do you? We love the poor. Do you? Okay. Let's look at Haiti. The planet against yeah. the poor. Who wins? The planet. Okay. You don't love the poor that much. Do you love the planet? Or do you hate capitalism? Let's pit those two things against each other. Oh, well, it this argument is so fucking stupid. Turns I'm sorry. Out we actually hate capitalism. How can we tell? Because you're willing to break it. And do you know what's going to happen? So what's going to happen in Sri Lanka with these 20 million people who now have nothing to eat? Are they going to eat all the animals? Are they going to burn all the firewood? They're stockpiling firewood in Germany. It's like, so is your environmental globalist utopia going to kill the poor and destroy the planet? And that's okay, because we'll wipe out capitalism. It's like, okay. Yeah, the, the dragon and the fear of the dragon drives ideologies, some of which can build a better world, some of which can destroy that world. Now, what do you think of that theory about, about trustworthiness? If the dragon that you're facing turns you into a terrified tyrant, you're not the man for the job. Is well, that a good theory? It's an interesting theory. Let me use that theory to challenge, because what, what does terror look like? Let me uh, table the turns, turn the tables on you. You are terrified, afraid, concerned about the dragon of something we can call communism, Marxism. Am I terrified of it? Not well, terrified okay, enough to okay. be a tyrant. Your theories had two components. Yeah. With I'm not head, paralyzed. Head a, dragon, head a dragon. Yeah, I'm not okay. paralyzed and I don't want to be a tyrant. The tyrant part, I think, hmm. is missing with you. Uh, yeah. But so you the, are very concerned. The intensity of your feeling uh, does not right. give much space, actually, at least in your public persona, for sitting quietly with the dragon and sipping in a couple of beers and thinking about this thing. Hmm. Uh, the intensity of your anger... Mm -hmm. concern about certain things you're seeing in society is that going to drive you off the path that ultimately takes us to a better world that's a good question i mean i don't i'm trying to get that right so we've kind of come to a cultural conclusion about the nazis yeah. do you get to be angry about the nazis seems the answer to that is yes well actually let me push back here um I also don't trust people who are angry about the Nazis. Because Fair. I mean the actual Nazis. <laughs> well, I, I, there's a lot, as you know, there's a lot of people in the world um, that uh, use actual Nazis to mean a lot I of know, things. I know, I know. One of them is, is very important to me. Me, for example. Well, you, use, yes. They, they, <laughs> well, he's a Nazi, I think, or magical I th super Nazi, as it turns out. I, I think they actually sort of steel men all their perspectives. They, I, I think a lot of people that call you a Nazi mean it. So Yeah. I, let, let, <laughs> bro, why do these people overuse steel man in the worst way possible? Like, they are not correctly using the terminology. Oh, in order to steel man their ideas, like, okay, well, then explain why he's a Nazi, motherfucker. Don't just say, oh, well, they actually believe you're a Nazi. That's not steel manning. Steel manning would be actually adequately pointing to why people say he's a Nazi. Oh, all these people believe you're a Nazi because they have seen you time and time again, at the very least, uh, uh, produce Nazi apologia constantly and consistently uh, uh, say that, like, Nazi ideology uh, is, is almost identical if not uh, uh, not as bad as, as communism, okay? A steel man is the opposite of a straw man when you, like, actually fucking describe your opposing side's arguments, like, perfectly. If you want a steel man, uh, Jordan Peterson being a Nazi, the way that you have to describe it is uh, by talking about cultural Marxism. 
Jordan Peterson routinely uses the terminology cultural Marxism. Jordan Peterson has the exact same enemies that the Nazis did. Jordan Peterson regularly and routinely talks about the moral decay. He always upholds Western superiority. These were the same exact concepts that Nazis believed in. Okay? The idea of cultural Marxism is just a whitewashed version, a modernized version of cultural Bolshevism, which is what the Nazis believed, that Jews were under the guise of communism, uh, trying to bring about moral degeneracy, moral decay, in an effort to destabilize Western, superior, uh, Western superiority and Western civilization by, uh, you know, allowing gay people to exist, allowing uh, queer people to exist. That is no different than what Jordan Peterson says on a daily fucking basis. He even uses the same exact fucking terminology. That would be a steel man from Lex, but he's not going to do that. <laughs> I'm, so, but I, I'm like, aware of that. Th there's an important thing there, though, because I, I went to the front in Ukraine. Yeah. And a lot of the people uh, that lost their home or their kind of, uh, that got to interact a lot with Russian soldiers, Ukrainian people that interact with the Russian soldiers, uh, they reported that the Russian soldiers really believe they're saving the the people of Ukraine in these local villages from the Nazis. I understand, yeah. So to them, it's not just that the Ukrainian government has or U Ukraine has some Nazis. It's like it has been the idea is that the Nazis have taken over Ukraine and we need to free them. This is the belief. Yeah. So this... Again, Nazi is still a dragon that lives, yeah, and and it's used by people because it's safe to sit next to that dragon and yeah. spread any kind of ideology you want. So I just want to kind of say that we um, have so, agreed on the uh, on the on the on the uh, on this particular dragon, but I still don't trust anybody who uses that. Yeah, one. but we have issues with boundaries, right? <laughs> no, no, it's so. This is a very complicated problem, right? Yeah. So René Girard believed that it was a human proclivity to demonize a scapegoat and then drive it out of the village. And yeah, wait, but that's okay. But he does that with communism. He does that with socialism. He never stops doing that with whatever he is described as the woke moralists. Like if that's a universal value that you're going to point to, and say that, like, that's what the Russians are doing. Well, d you're fucking doing it all the time. What do you mean? I've thought about that a lot. We need a place to put Satan. Like, seriously, this is a serious issue. Should he be inside the village or outside? Well, maybe he should be inside you. Right? That's, that's the fundamental essence of the Christian doctrine. It's like Satan is best fought on the battleground of your soul. And that's, that's right. Bro, oh, that's just, I mean, you're on crack, dude. That's just like, I don't know. I just, this is why I'm, I'm always, you have to be really into fucking God to listen to a dude like this and go like, man, he's really spitting right now. Like this, it's, this is why I always say like, when you go full God, when you go God mode, like you're just going to lose a big chunk of your audience. Even if you try to, even if you try to philosophize the existence of God or organize religion and like reduce it back to like its symbolism and how it manifests itself in your everyday existence, like you go full God mode, like most people are gonna be like, okay, dude, you sound like you are undergoing like a like a mental health uh, problem. Okay, you sound like you're having like a schizophrenic, a paranoid schizophrenic attack or something. And I feel like Jordan Peterson, back in the day at the very least, did like a decent job of trying to um, trying to, to oversimplify Christian doctrine and Christian conservatism uh, and, and basically turned it into like, oh, well, you know, we're, we're, just, we're just experiencing it in our everyday lives uh, all the time in ways that you can understand. Now he's just like, Satan is inside of you. <laughs> That's what you need to do. You need to constantly battle the Satan inside of you. That's right. Can you actually put words to the kind of dragon that you're fighting? Is it, is it, is it communism? It's the spirit of Cain. Yeah. 
Can you elaborate? Well, what the spirit of Cain is. Even fucking Lex Friedman's laughing at this. Holy shit. So after Adam and Eve are thrown out of paradise for becoming self-conscious or when they become self-conscious, they're destined to work. And the reason for that, as far as I can tell, is that to become self-conscious is to become aware of the future. Never forget what I said. You're, you're just like Bible weebs are just weebs. Okay. But instead of like learning everything about fucking One Piece, they learned everything about the Bible. And at least the One Piece, like, at least One Piece is like making people happy. You know what I mean? At least it's like content. Bible's got some content too, but like the most avid One Piece fan still kind of recognizes that it's not real. You know what I mean? Luffy or whatever, like human beings are not actually made out of gum. Like, they're not running around being like, well, you know, the hidden pirate treasure is actually the friendships that we've cultivated along the way. And you can look at it. For example, think about I'm rubber and you're glue. Everything you say to me bounces back off of me and sticks onto you. This was said by the ancient philosopher... Alexander Solsa dick shit. <laughs> and you can tell that even back then, they had the supreme understanding that human beings can actually be made out of rubber. Jordan Peterson, instead of the Bible, is like talking about One Piece lore. <laughs> The metaphysical realities that you see in One Piece bears itself out in the real world, in everyday existence, all around us. That's to become aware of death. That certainly happens in the Adam and Eve story. To have the scales fall from your eyes. And then the consequence of that is that you now have to labor to prevent the catastrophes of the future. That's work. Work is sacrifice. Sacrifice of the present to the future. It's delay of gratification. It's maturity. It's sacrifice to something as well, and in the spirit of something. Okay, so now Adam and Eve have two children, Cain and Abel. So those are the first two people in history, because the Garden of Eden doesn't count. And they're the first two people who are born rather than created. So they're the first two people. And that's a hell of a story, because... It's a story of fratricidal murder that degenerates into genocide, flood, and tyranny. So that's fun for the opening salvo of the story, let's say. And Abel and Cain both make sacrifices. And for some reason, Abel's sacrifices please. The fucking moron, they toiled in paradise. That's why Eve hated it. I'm a Bible weave. Yeah, you see, the original dragon of chaos was Eve. It was not the, it was not the metaphysical snake in the bush if you will, it was Eve's own volition. Even before, Eve never said thank you for being born out of Adam's rib cage as a piece of barbecue. Eve, as the dragon of chaos, wanted to go shopping because women be shopping. That's in the Bible. Women be shopping for apples from the tree. Women always making shit hard for the men, am I right? Here, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it fluidly from Jordan Peterson over to Andrew Tate, okay? Like, Jordan Peterson describes it like, like that, right? The true dragon of chaos was the woman, Eve, who cast all men into eternal damnation by toiling the ground rather than living in the heavenly garden that God intended for humans to be in. Why? Because of female hypergamy, <laughs> women wanted bold water instead of the type of water that God had given us men, right? And all of a sudden, you got women constantly wanting more, 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 but can't provide for themselves because they're women. So they had to eat the fucking apple when the man was like, no, don't fuck this up. I have my Bugatti in heaven, 
But all of a sudden, a woman, Eve, a bitch, wanted more. And of course, you see, a woman would never be able to exist on its own, right? Because a woman is made from the ribcage of man. That's in the Bible. Top G is God. That's right. Yeah, typical woman bit off more than she can chew. And that's why now you're stuck here. But of course, if you join Hustlers University, now you can learn more about how to fucking own the women. It's God. It's not exactly clear why. And Keynes don't. Now, there's an implication in the text that it's because Cain sacrifices are true or second rate. God says that Abel brings the finest to the sacrificial altar. He doesn't say that about Cain. So you could imagine that Cain is sacrificing away, but he's he's holding something in reserve. He's not all in. He's not bringing his best to the table. He's not offering his best to God. And so Abel thrives like mad. And everyone loves him. And he gets exactly what he needs and wants, exactly when he needs and wants it. He's favored of God. And Cain is bearing this terrible burden forward and working, and his sacrifices are rejected. So he gets resentful, really resentful, enough, resentful enough to call God out and say something like, this is quite the creation you've got going here. I'm breaking myself in half and nothing good's coming my way. What the hell's up with that? And then there's Abel, the sun's shining on it's him. It's such a strange accident. You've had to watch so much of his content to get it correct. It's amazing. It's amazing. Or I'm just giving myself a brain disease for your entertainment. Every day. How dare you? It's like, okay. But this is God that Cain's talking to. And so God says what Cain least wants to hear, which is what God usually says to people. I love that they talked about dangerous ideologies and then went directly into Justin Trudeau. Uh, I don't want to watch the rest of this, dude. I can't. It's so stupid. The question might be... Here, he gives us some brief insight into the creative process that allows him to come up with these deep word thoughts. So I have the question. The question might be something like, uh, put, your, put your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Okay. What does that mean exactly? Put, what does house mean? What does, put, what does put mean, that active verb? What does perfect and order mean? Why before you criticize the world? What does it mean to criticize? What does it mean to criticize the world? How can you do that properly or improperly? So I have the question. The question might be something like, uh, put your... What does put mean? I trust Tupi. I trust Matt Ridley. They thought about these things deeply. They're not just saying, oh, Longer. He always says he's listening to a critic, but I don't think he's reading my threads because here he is doing his talking points again, how environment and everything are the same word. He hasn't noticed there's not a soul alive that thinks this is a good point. I ask you about... Plus, he's still pronouncing hello to more as hello, Mador. Come on, my dude. That's pretty funny, too. I forgot to even point to that. A quickie. The U.S. Replace being below replacement birth rates means we have abandoned the virgin and the child in the most fundamental sense. The most fundamental sense. Great new talking point. Who should you trust about climate change? Facts. Can't be an unerring guide, but choosing whoever is the most calm apparently is the most unerring guide, plus dragons. Some of the more incredible logic about how in order to do science, you must believe in God. He makes this argument all the time. People must find it very convincing. But Nietzsche said God is dead and we have killed him and we'll not find enough water to wash away all the blood. So that was Nietzsche. He's no fool. He's got a way with words. He you? certainly does. And so then you think, okay, well, we killed the transcendent. Well... What does that mean for science? Well, it frees it up because all that nonsense about a deity is just the idiot superstition that stops the scientific um, what process from moving forward. That's basically the new atheist claim, something like that. It's like, wait a second. Do you believe in the transcendent if you're a scientist? You sound and look like a TV show from the movie Idiocracy. Me? Thank you. I agree. Meanwhile, Jordan Peterson, he, he big man, use big word. That must mean big man, use big word. He must be right. He must be right, even if he tell me, big man tell me, that things are actually good and will only get better for me. 
I no think critically. Big man use big word. He think critically for me. Which is good. I smart just like big man using big word. You no use big word. You know big man. You might be big physically. But you know big brain. Like Jordan. Jordan big brain. Why? Because big brain confused me. My little brain. The reason why Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate are successful in the exa the reason why they're both successful is because they both rely on telling you that the the way the world works is actually good, right? That pre-existing forms of oppression, pre-existing hierarchies are good. Okay? Misogyny, patriarchy, white supremacy, they subtly tell you all this reactionary shit. And the reason why they're successful or their personalities are, are, are um, at least like appealing to a broader population is because that population is very insecure, insecure men in general. People like Jordan Peterson because they're insecure about their, uh, they're insecure about their own intellectual desires. They're insecure about their own uh, intellect. So they look to someone like Jordan Peterson to be like, he's filling all the holes. He's giving answers to things. I want to trust him because he seems like a smart guy. The reason why people look at Andrew Tate and say he's, he's actually brilliant. He's a good orator. He's a good, uh, uh, he's a good narrator of the frustrations I feel is because, again, you're insecure about your, your masculinity. You're insecure about your own manhood. And you look to someone like Andrew Tate who represents himself as the beacon of masculinity. This is a lib take. Yeah, I am. I am a lib after all. It's two different kinds of father figures. Of course, Andrew Tate is significantly more appealing because people uh, ultimately are going to get bored of Jordan Peterson. Whereas Andrew Tate is at least like entertaining and dumbs down his rhetoric for you to understand. It's the difference between George W. Bush and Donald Trump. Well, not George W. Bush, but like it's the difference between Jeb Bush and Donald Trump. They both advocate for the same shit. Donald Trump just dumbs it down. So he's more and he's more charismatic. So more people love Donald Trump than they love George Bush. Or not George Bush, Jeb Bush. And the answer is, well, not only do you believe in it, you believe in it more than anything else. Because if you're a scientist, you believe in what object... Did you see the article? What article? Andrew Tate is on the front line of The Guardian? What? Next to your theory, more than you believe in your theory. Now, we got to think that through very carefully. So your theory describes the world. And as far as you're concerned, your description of the world is the world. But because you're a scientist, you think, well, even though that's my description of the world and that's what I believe, there's something beyond what I believe. And that's the object. And so I'm going to throw my theory against the object and see where it'll break.